So what I want to do today is really um, uh, try to contribute to our understanding of this building um, uh, as it was constructed in the Middle Ages. And first I want to um, uh, underline the way that the structure of Notre Dame has uh, changed continually, really since this church was first um, uh, begun in the 1160s, it's been subject to a continual cycle of change and modification. And I think that's very important when we think about uh, its current history. I then want to look at some of the uh, formal and structural features that made it so significant in its time uh, and in the centuries that followed and think about why it was imitated in a number of other uh, churches across medieval Europe. And then finally, I want to look at um, a number of medieval representations of the, of the church, particularly its exterior, and think about how they might inform the way we think about restoring it. So I want to just begin by um, setting out the site of Notre Dame, which now, um, if you know the site, it's, it's being largely cleared uh, in the 19th century, but we need to understand it in its medieval context here I'm showing two early modern representations of the Ile de la Cité, um, um, uh, surrounded by the river. And as you can perhaps see from this diagram at the bottom, um, uh, it was frequently subject to floods. We have lots of medieval chronicles recording uh, the flooding of the island um, in the 12th, 13th and 14th centuries, um, which required them to kind of build up um, uh, a... Uh, flood-free area at the centre of the island here on which they could build Notre Dame. Um, so this is not, uh, in some ways, ideal um, uh, construction site for a church as ambitious as Notre Dame. But in fact, as far as we know, it's not, never suffered serious structural failure on account of its foundations uh, in the same way as somewhere like Winchester Cathedral has. So what I want to do is just follow um, briefly the uh, construction history of the site um, and think about some of the kind of significant moments in its history. Um, so the new church um, was officially begun in 1163 um, uh, when the foundation stone was laid by the Pope. Probably there'd been a bit of preparation in advance of that. And certainly um, there were a number of prior structures um, on the site, a cluster of churches, baptistries, and Episcopal buildings, which is quite typical of um, uh, early medieval uh, ecclesiastical sites. You can still go down, um, well, I don't know if you can right now, but uh, certainly before the fire, you can still go down under the kind of car park and see um, the uh, uh, archaeological dig in which they uh, found the remains of this, the, the major basilica, but you can see that there are a number of other churches on the same site. So this is a, a complicated um, terrain uh, on which to build, and one where um, construction uh, or destruction of the older churches only took place gradually uh, as the new churches were built, so that um, uh, before the new cathedral, new Gothic church was completed, services and so on could continue in the older ones. So here we see a model of um, uh, the construction of the East End as it was in the, uh, around about 1170. We know that this is built pretty quickly. Um, it's on the river, so it's very easy to transport stone and other building materials to the site. Um, and this was a very wealthy um, uh, bishopric, so they had plenty of resources to pay for a large workforce and um, uh, to get materials whenever they needed them, more or less. Um, we know that by 1177, the East End was completed. We're told by uh, a number of chroniclers that the, the choir was opened, it was um, officially consecrated. So at this point, um, we have to imagine that the whole of the, the eastern arm, um, with its um, uh, transepts and chapels and so on, was complete. What we don't know, and I'll come back to this, we don't know exactly if the stone vaults had been set in. Um, uh, here they're shown being constructed, but as we'll see, um, there's some uncertainty about that. Um, but these um, drawings, I should say, were made in recent years by um, uh, Danny Santon and uh, Andrew, the late Andrew Tallon, um, who'd been studying this building very heavily in the years before the fire. And it's thanks to their studies in many ways that we understand this building relatively well. By about 1200, we know that um, uh, work was continuing apace on the nave. Here you can see the remains, the outlines of the uh, former basilica that was 
uh, gradually destroyed. And you get a sense, uh, I hope, of uh, two of the kind of salient features of this new building. It's extraordinary height um, uh, relative to the time, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but also its breadth. Um, uh, uh, the fact that it has two aisles running along um, either side of the nave. Um, and I will talk about that as well. I should say that these reconstructions are relatively uh, accurate and reliable insofar as we understand the process of construction um, uh, in the Middle Ages, except perhaps for two features. One um, is uh, the way that the vaults are shown with the roof here. Um, in fact, as I'll... Sh as I'll show, in most cases, it seems that the roof, the full roof was erected um, before the stone vaults were set in place. Um, uh, that's partly because they needed to, to cover up the building as they were building it to ensure that no rain and so on could get in, um, but also it meant that they could use the roof timbers as a form of scaffolding um, uh, to help when they were hauling up materials. And that bears some uh, significance, I think, for when we think, come to think about uh, the restoration of this uh, roof. Um, the other fact is that you wouldn't, in fact, be able to see all the way through, as you can see now, it'd be a huge gale in there. We know that services are already taking place in the East End, so there must have been some kind of temporary wall. This is my rather amateur um, uh, addition to this, but we know um, from uh, descriptions, for instance, of the rebuilding of Canterbury's East End in the late, 11th, uh, tw late 12th century um, and somewhere like Beauvais, that it was quite typical that you would erect a temporary wall um, so that um, uh, services could continue behind that wall relatively uninterrupted while construction was taking place uh, on the site. And of course, this is going to be uh, an important question for the restoration is, you know, when do they let people in? Um, uh, when do they start using this building? Are they going to do so even before um, uh, the restoration is complete? By 1225, we know from a number of sources that construction is pretty much uh, finished, uh, and they're working now on the west facade and the western towers, um, which had, uh, which because they represent such a large mass of masonry, um, were one of the slowest parts to be uh, built, and they were also finishing off um, the nave um, roof, um, and we'll look at some of the kind of dendrochronological, dendrochronological evidence for um, uh, the roof timbers later. But what I would say is that this is by no means the first fire um, uh, to be suffered by Notre Dame. We have a, a chronicle account by Guillaume Le Breton, William um, from Brittany, who tells us that in 1218, there was a major fire in the East End. And he tells us that um, it was the night before the Feast of the Assumption, um, uh, when a thief hid uh, in the roof timbers um, and he was trying to uh, steal the chandeliers and lamps that were suspended for this important feast day. And something went wrong, and the um, textiles on the choir stalls caught fire, then the choir stalls caught fire, and the East End went up in flames. Now, we don't know very much about the extent of the fire, and there's not a lot of evidence for the kind of damage it caused. Um, but one change um, that that seems to have precipitated was a change in the internal elevations um, uh, where originally there were four levels for internal elev elevation, I'll show you that later, uh, and in fact they ended up rebuilding the eastern windows, making them much larger. And it's possibly after that point, and only after that point, that they erect the stone vaults. Um, there is some question about this. Um, it would seem strange that they were conducting services and so on under just an open wooden roof. But on the other hand, it's not clear how somebody, if they had erected the stone vaults, it's not clear how somebody who was hiding in the wooden roof space would have been able to um, steal the chandeliers. So there's a kind of question um, uh, that's been raised about that. No sooner had construction finished on the main body of the church, then a number of um, uh, additions and modifications start to take place. And this is not entirely unusual in the context of medieval building projects. Once you've got these um, revenue streams coming in to support construction, um, you might as well direct them towards um, a new building. Um, each bishop, in some ways, and new patrons want to make their stamp 
um, on the building. But by 1250, the architectural shell, including the towers, was largely complete. But almost immediately, they start modifying it. And the first modification includes these construction of these um, uh, extra chapels between the buttresses of the nave, providing additional space for new altars and for burial. And also, um, uh, two of the most prominent Parisian architects of the time um, are responsible for remodelling the transepts, these, um, the arms that cross the main body of the, of the church, um, and they updated them with the great rose windows that you see under construction here, um, and with another a number of other architectural features that proved to be um, extremely influential um, uh, on subsequent buildings. So they're modifying it from the moment that they build, and uh, that process of modification continues into the early 14th century, um, uh, where um, not only do they build new Having built the new um, chapels off the nave, they then build a whole series of new chapels around the east end um, and given a kind of um, a facelift, um, adding extra pinnacles, adding extra kind of detailing, um, so that the whole of the east end takes on a kind of a new profile, um, has extra space for chapels, um, um, and looks radically different from what it probably did in the 1160s when it was begun. Um, and it's around this time, too, that a new choir screen, a stone choir screen, is constructed uh, in the east end of the cathedral. And that was, um, uh, as you can see, its western face here was originally directly located below the crossing. Um, that was demolished um, uh, well before the fire. Um, but um, nonetheless, this stone choir screen whose um, north and south walls run along here was one of the most, from a kind of point of view of a medieval art historian, one of the most um, valuable parts and important parts of the interior and potentially the most vulnerable uh, to destruction. Um, that process of uh, change continues, though, um, probably the, in some ways the high point of, of, of construction in Notre Dame is in the, comes in the 12th, 13th and 14th century um, uh, but even after this, there are uh, minor modifications to the interior. You can see here that um, by 1750, that western um, uh, screen had been replaced with a kind of Baroque version. We know that there were kind of tapestries hung um, and paintings suspended in the nave, um, much of the coloured glass that must have made Notre Dame a fairly dark building, um, um, perhaps not quite as dark as it is today because a lot of the glass is now is 19th century and is very much darker than the medieval glass, but um, uh, a lot of that had been removed so that um, uh, Notre Dame was kind of transformed into this kind of glass house that we see here. So this building, real and imagined, uh, changes constantly um, through the course of its history. Um, and if we think about uh, the restoration uh, of the building. I think calling it restoration in some ways is artificial. Um, as I've tried to show, in some ways, it's a building that's continually subject to change. Um, there's always the ongoing repairs and so on. Sometimes they're major, sometimes they're minor. Um, but in the mid-19th century, a more um, uh, substantial restoration is prompted in considerable part by the publication of Victor Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris, which includes a great lament uh, over the state of this uh, church and its, its ruinous condition. Um, and here I show you, well, one um, photograph uh, just as restoration is beginning in the 1840s. You can perhaps just make out um, uh, the scaffolding here. There's a very interesting relationship, I should say, as well, between the restoration and um, technologies of photography. Uh, these are some of the very earliest um, uh, photographs uh, that, that were made. Um, and here you see uh, the west facade, again in the process of restoration, you can see that there's still some um, uh, supports in place and they haven't yet, all these figures along here, um, probably Old Testament kings and prophets, were destroyed in the revolution when they were thought to be um, French kings and they were gradually replaced and now if you look at the west facade you can see that all these um, uh, niches are filled but we're looking at a kind of intermediate um, phase. Um, here you can see um, uh, the proposals by Ville le Duc and Lassus to replace the great spire or flesh over the crossing that was probably made 
uh, in the 1260s when the transepts were modified and was destroyed um, uh, in the 1790s or were taken down. It was already um, uh, considerably damaged. Um, but as we'll see a little bit later, we know quite a lot about its original appearance and uh, Villa de Duque and Lassie's proposed to reconstruct it. Um, and here I just show you another drawing uh, that survives from this period, just to show that these kind of um, sometimes quite kind of fantastical schemes for rebuilding Notre Dame are nothing new. Um, uh, this is uh, a proposal to effectively construct uh, spires like those at, at, at Shark Cathedral on top of the great western towers um, at Notre Dame. Um, here you see in more detail um, the proposal for um, uh, the new spire um, built of um, uh, oak and lead um, uh, with a minimal amount of, of, of steel. The later Duke had a sometimes he, he used iron and steel, sometimes he preferred wood. Um, uh, for the, when he rebuilt the um, uh, tribune roofs, he, he largely stuck to wood. Um, uh, and here you can see his um, uh, spire before the fire. And finally, in some ways, if we like, the last kind of um, uh, imaginary um, uh, cathedral, this is the um, uh, cathedral as it was scanned by Andrew Tallon um, uh, less than a decade ago. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to, to fully understand the technology that he's used here, um, uh, but as I understand, there's like a kind of a three-dimensional laser scan that enables him, enables him to model very precisely the position of every element of the cathedral in three-dimensional space. So um, Andrew has already talked about that, that night, I'm sure. Uh, we, we probably all can remember uh, the circumstances of the fire and watching it for me, certainly live. Um, uh, and here we see a view of the damage. Um, uh, the crossing um, where the spire was originally, um, that was destroyed. Here, this hole um, uh, destroyed when the spire collapsed and fell onto the nave. Um, but perhaps most alarming of all, this hole as well. And I can't quite understand why this hole was made. Um, as I was watching the fire footage, and perhaps others had a similar experience, I was feeling relatively confident um, that despite the size of the flames, that actually the church wouldn't be destroyed because these stone vaults are precisely designed to act as a, uh, separator, a separator between the main body of the church with its highly flammable textiles and woodwork um, and the upper uh, roofs, which also have very dry timber. Um, but the moment you have a hole um, uh, in the vaults, the, the moment that sp um, uh, burning embers and so on can fall through there, then um, the whole building is potentially compromised. And, and I think that the, um, the most important um, activity for the firefighters was to really make sure that those what fell through the roof didn't set light to um, the interior. Um, I'm not going to, to read all this now, but I put... Um, up a very vivid description of um, the Great Fire at Canterbury Cathedral in 1174, um, just to underline the point that fires are not an unusual occurrence in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, in a combination of highly, of very dry timbers, highly flammable textiles, multiple lamps and candles and so on, made for um, uh, uh, a regular problem of fires. And here, I'm kind of cheating here because I'm showing Wenceslas Holler's uh, image of, of uh, old St. Paul's Cathedral um, burning in the Great Fire. Um, but it's interesting as well that actually, if we are to trust uh, his uh, image, it looks like, init initially at least, the fire is uh, in the roof space where you'd expect it to be. It's the most flammable uh, part. So um, I want to uh, turn briefly to think about... Um, uh, the kind of formal and um, structural significance of, of Notre Dame. Um, it's, I call attention to two features before, um, both of which seem to be inspired in some part by the great basilicas built by the Emperor Constantine in Rome. That is to say that it's got two aisles, well, here we are uh, with Notre Dame, two aisles flanking um, uh, the nave, that's relatively unusual, uh, especially in the 12th century, um, but that imitates what we had at Old St. Peter's in Rome before it was replaced in the 16th century 
Um, and also the height of Notre Dame um, seems to respond to old St. Peter's. At the time, its vault, when it was first built, was 34 metres above the ground. This is one of the very tallest um, uh, structures, um, certainly the tallest vaults um, in medieval Europe at that time, accentuated by the relatively narrow um, central vessel. And in some ways, I think we can think of this as a bit of one-upmanship. It's just very slightly taller um, uh, than the roof at um, Old St. Peter's. Um, and we see this kind of one-upmanship taking place all the time. But the difference is that this has a stone vault, whereas uh, St. Peter's was open, as you see here. So St. Peter's, like many um, uh, uh, English Romanesque churches still, uh, if you go to like Ely or Peterborough, where they had a, uh, a fire a few years ago, um, uh, had a, a wooden roof very susceptible to flames, to, to spreading fires. Um, Notre Dame has a stone vault, which provides a kind of fire break between the main body of the church and the roof space above. Um, uh, the only sort of principal difference between the two buildings is that whereas um, uh, Old St. Peter's had a kind of staggered aisle, the, the middle one slightly higher than the outer one, at Notre Dame it's as though they've inserted a, um, a, a platform in here so that you have a gallery running along the whole length of the church, providing additional space um, uh, on the uh, interior. And if we look at this uh, stress model of, of Notre Dame, and I'm hoping that people here might be able to explain this better to me than I understand it, but um, uh, you can see areas of stress uh, in the structure of Notre Dame, but you can also see the way that these, um, the roofs, uh, the vaults of the, of the aisles, which form the, the floor of those galleries running along, actually act as a, effectively as additional flying buttresses, um, uh, channeling some of the thrust of the high vaults out um, from uh, these central piers in a way onto the uh, intermediate ones and especially onto the thick outer buttresses. Those um, outer buttresses are uh, very thick at Notre Dame. This is a, we don't know exactly, well, there was some debate about whether there were flying buttresses intended from the very beginning. Um, uh, but certainly the ones that we have here, which stretch out all the way across those double aisles out to the outer walls, um, helping to uh, counteract the horizontal thrust generated by those heavy stone vaults. Um, these um, uh, were probably some of the earliest flying buttresses in France and seem to have um, uh, kind of created a, a fashion for them, not least because they allowed these upper walls to be extremely thin. These are much thinner upper walls than you have uh, in a church, like at most English churches, for instance, somewhere like Lincoln or uh, Canterbury, you have very thick upper walls. At Notre Dame, uh, they are extremely thin, and that has some consequences when thinking about its restoration. Um, here, I just show you three buildings where Notre Dame, in some ways, is imitated. Um, people were clearly looking to this building as a model for their own projects. Here at Bourges Cathedral, um, these two images you can see um, begun in the 1190s at Bourges imitates um, uh, the double aisle structure of Notre Dame, um, although it does away with that uh, gallery so that you have this kind of staggered pyramidal form. Um, here at Mont de la Jolie, not far from Paris, um, uh, uh, the collegiate church, first of all, was begun in the mid 12th century with these very similar, super slender uh, upper walls that almost kind of melt away. Um, uh, when photographed like this, um, but also around about 1300, it acquired a ring of uh, additional chapels rather, around the East End, rather like um, uh, in Notre Dame. And here at Westminster Abbey, uh, in fact, the chapter house, the tracery here, the design of these windows, almost exactly um, imitates some of the windows in the side chapels, the new side chapels at Notre Dame, um, uh, uh, built just a few years earlier. Here, I just want to uh, underline the fact that the, um, uh, this is, does show a relatively accurate view of the way that the roof is built before uh, the stone vaults, which are then erected over this um, uh, centering using the um, uh, roof timbers as a scaffolding. And I want to underline as well, or to at least contribute my understanding of the debate over the structural significance of those stone vaults, many of which apparently have been compromised by the fire, and that's going to be one of the most difficult decisions, I think, when restoring Notre Dame, 
is when they've got standing fabric, so stone vaults still in situ but severely damaged by the fire, are they going to have to take those down and are they going to rebuild them as they were? Um, uh, but I'll just show you two images, or three images, but particularly two images of Urskamp near Noyon, which show the way that in some cases when these vaults collapsed, um, uh, the webs between the ribs um, uh, fell down, and in some cases the ribs have fallen off and the webs have stayed in place. So there's a long debate about the significance of the ribs uh, in Gothic vaults versus the webs, the bits in between. Uh, and I think the consensus now is that it, it, their kind of structural significance varies uh, from case to case. Finally, we come to uh, the roof timbers. These were analysed in the 1990s, not quite as systematically as would be done today, but nonetheless, we know that they consist of a number of different um, uh, of, of wood of different dates. Most of the East End, um, those timbers date from the 1220s, so after that fire in 1218. Um, uh, the Nave timbers a little bit later, as you would expect. Um, uh, we know that's completed by about 1240, but they also reuse some uh, earlier timbers from 1160s, so from the uh, original construction. And then there were a number of repairs as well. We know also that most of those trees were about 100, 120 years old when they were felled, and that the entire roof um, uh, included a, about 1,000 oak trees. Um, um, so this is a significant feat of carpentry at its time, but also even in the Middle Ages it was hard to obtain timbers of this size. It's quite common that the king has to provide oaks for uh, roof timber for major construction projects because only the king has the big forests that are left relatively untouched where these uh, big trees survive. And then lastly, and very quickly, I just want to um, show you a number of images of Notre Dame that as, as it survives in uh, a number of uh, medieval representations. These are blown up from, uh, these are details of manuscripts. In many cases, those manuscripts are very small, so that you don't do that well uh, in blown up. But I hope you can see, as I take you through, that this distinctive um, uh, silhouette of Notre Dame with its western towers and its central spire is um, uh, picked up again and again in uh, medieval representations of Paris. Interestingly, often paired here with the Sao Chapelle nearby, which it too has a spire, which too uh, was rebuilt in the 19th century. Um, uh, but you can see it again and again. This very distinctive profile um, was considered a significant attribute of Notre Dame and of the city of Paris, and I think that's certainly something um, uh, to think about when considering its restoration. And the last thing I would conclude with is that not only was the roof something to be seen afar, but also it was something from which Paris could be viewed. Um, we know that all, certainly by the 1430s, tourists or visitors were climbing up the towers and looking out um, onto the city. Um, uh, uh, Victor Hugo gives a wonderful description, this kind of panorama of Paris as seen from the tops of the towers. Um, and this con tradition continued right up uh, to the present day, or until the fire. So when we think about um, uh, how this building should be restored, I think we need to think about it not only in kind of terms of its structure, but in the position, uh, it, its location in this kind of urban uh, landscape of, of, of Paris, both as something, a way of viewing the city, but also as something to be seen from afar. Thank you.